uh, as you can see here, we're going to be talking about the Easy DOE platform, which was new in Jump 17, but I'll be running Jump 18 today. And there are a few new things and improvements, and so I'm happy to show those to people. So here's my outline, very briefly, why Easy DOE, uh, and then a little longer discussion on why DOE. And then I have two main examples, and if there's time, maybe we'll even do a third, but where we actually just go in and use the guided Easy DOE platform. And in between the two main examples will be a review of many of the important concepts about factors and models that we will use in the guided Easy DOE process. So why Easy DOE? Uh, Jump has been around for, um, I guess, 1989, so about 35 years. And DOE was certainly in it when I saw it in the 90s for the first time. Uh, but one of the things about Jump being a broad uh, tool for data visualization and exploration and analysis is uh, the DOE platform is separate from the analysis platform, which is separate from certain visualization platforms. And as a result, as, as Jump grew with DOE, it was kind of spread out. And so one of the ideas here was to try to make this easier in sort of a single end-to-end -end coverage of every step of that experimentation. And so uh, we're hoping this will streamline the experience uh, and this new user interface, which even between 17 and 18 has changed mainly because they've been doing some uh, user usability studies and actually doing designed experiments on the interface and trying to improve it to make it so people will make fewer mistakes as they use it. And so there are two modes. This week we're talking about the guided mode, which is aimed at the novice experimenter. That's the default mode in Easy DOE. And next Friday, I'll be talking about the flexible mode, which we'll use for more demanding situations when, uh, quite frankly, the guided approach breaks down due to some of the real world situations that happen when we do experimentation. One of the features of Easy DOE is that it will produce a comprehensive summary report. This is automatically written based on the current state of the experiment. We'll see that. You can save your work at any time, return to that same point. And as a result of all this, it's gonna be easier to share your experimental results with others. Now I gave a very brief comment on most of these bullets. There's a full uh, developer tutorial by Mark Bailey and the link for that is at the bottom of this slide but Gail may provide that to you separately. So if you want to learn more about, you know, how the Easy DOE platform was developed and why, uh, you can certainly explore that uh, webcast. Now, why do we use DOE? So this is my 40th year using DOE. And, it, you know, it altered my career when I first saw it. Uh, I was a uh, scientist at Honeywell in Minneapolis at the time. And uh, it just changed the way I did experimentation so much. So I left and joined the first DOE software company back in the 80s. But why are we doing this? I hope we all want to develop products at lower cost, get quicker answers, solve bigger problems, and provide our management uh, information that lets them have, make a better informed decision about a technology. Sometimes the answer is we should kill it. You know, we've, we spent a lot of money on this and it doesn't look like it's gonna do any better. Well, you can figure that out quicker using design of experiments. Ideally, what we hope is we find a, a more improved and a robust solution when we do this type of experimentation. So some of the things we're hoping to be able to do and we'll show here today, how you can more rapidly answer the what if questions about, hey, what does this factor do? What's the impact of it? When you have lots of factors, how do you identify the important uh, subset of it uh, when you, you know, sometimes you might have 10 or more factors, you're probably not going to build a predictive model, you're gonna, but you might be interested in what's the three, four, five factors that contribute the most to building that predictive model. We're going to show a little bit of doing sensitivity and trade space analysis because we're going to have more than one response, and we'll even show optimization across that. And these last two bullets, which are related more to sequential experimentation, we're not going to cover today. But if you think about this, if we can be efficient by running subsets of all possible combinations, you can, for the same resources and constraints, solve bigger problems. And if we do this sequentially, we can be as cost effective as possible 
and run no more trials than are needed to get a useful answer. So if you're not sold on DOE and you haven't heard any of these reasons, I hope you're even more sold now because um, I really think if you haven't been using it, it can potentially uh, alter your career in a very positive way too. So this is the uh, easy DOE parts of its interface and it's different in 18 than it is in 17. They've actually made it easier to edit. They did some usability studies, as I mentioned, on how people interact with putting in the names, choosing the goals, putting in the limits, things of that nature here. So at the top are the three responses in the example I'm gonna feature. There's a speed, a contrast, and a cost. Our goal was to maximize the speed, maximize the contrast, minimize the cost. You can see where I'm choosing it from a list of maximize, match, target, minimize, or none. And then on the right, I've got some limits. Like I, I don't want to have any speed values below 5.3. I don't want any comp contrast values below 0.7. And I don't want any cost values above 0.28. So that's, that's what I'm hoping this technology will deliver for us. Down below are the factors that we believe affect those responses. So we have two sensitizers, a die and a reaction time. In this situation, they're all continuous. Uh, and you can see their ranges. Uh, there's a lower and an upper value listed to the uh, right of each of them. And finally, since we really are interested in optimization and really fully characterizing this process, we're gonna want a response surface design, which in this case, for these this many factors, defaults to 21 trials. So that's our interface. We're gonna eventually drop out and actually type all of that in and, and, and do it. When we do it, and collect data and analyze it, Jump will automatically create the report that's shown on the left. It's about five or six pages long there. I don't expect you to read that, but I have sort of blown up the last page where this is Jump's prediction profiler in the report. And so on the, the left here, maybe I can highlight some of these things here. These are the three responses. So the red number is the current prediction at these four settings for those control variables. Okay, and then the, the blue numbers here are just the confidence intervals around that uh, prediction. I've added to this, and I'll show you how, the red, the green, and the blue shading, which is where we do not meet our requirements. So what we really want is an answer where at these settings, the predictions are all in the white region, which they are. The cost is below 0.28, the contrast is above 0.7, and the speed is above 5.3. So we've gotten to an answer that meets all of our requirements. Now, the, when we get into Jump, this will be interactive. But here you can see we're actually you know, able to generate this final report. And that's, that's where we're going to end up. Here's the rest of the report where we give you the factor information, the response information, the starting model, the design with the response values. So this is the, you know, the actual data that we collected. And then some final model parameter estimates. But then we have some graphical results. We tell you what the excluded terms are. We have some residual plots where you can spot outliers in your data that might need more investigation. And we have an actual versus predicted plot, which again might graphically show you where there are some things uh, that are amiss. But what we're interested in here again is the white region is where we're meeting the requirements on these various uh, responses. So here's the same. Um, dialog boxes that I showed before. The difference is on the bottom one where it said roll. In this case, all four factors are continuous, but there are two other types, discrete numeric and categorical, which we're going to go into in example two. So I'm just highlighting the differences in the uh, dialog boxes here, but we'll actually use those other two options in the second example. So we're going to drop out to jump and recreate the uh, example that we've shown here.